I want you to know I've learned the key to happiness, and you can have that too. One is to leave Congress. The other part of it is, though, <laughs> the other part of it is I just want you to wake up and look in the mirror in the morning, and your hair's all disheveled, and you got sleep in your eye, and you just look in the mirror and say, I'm so happy Hillary Clinton is not the President of the United States. <laughs> See, look how happy you are. It's that easy. Uh, I'm joined this evening by my wife, Julie. Uh, Julie and I have been blessed to be married uh, some 28 years. She was born and raised in Mesa, Arizona. So we are very blessed to have three kids, uh, two of which are married. Um, being from Utah, I will clarify that they were not married to each other. Um, we're very blessed with a great family. And uh, I got to tell you, it's been a tremendous honor to serve in the United States Congress. I never thought that as I grew up that uh, I was going to end up in Congress. I actually, while born in California, I actually went to Cocoa Paw, and then I went to Chaparral High School. I was a firebird back when we were 0 and 10 on that football team, when we were not very good. We weren't kind of cheating our way saying, no, we're not a 5A team, we're a 4A team. I, I, those were the good old days. Um, I had an amazing experience. And, and part of what I want to share with you tonight is you talk about kind of the most important topics and things in, in life. And I get a little emotional about this because I talk about my family, I talk about our country, I, I get a little little glass jawed along the way. But I, I'm so amazed at the miracle that is the United States of America. This is the greatest country on the face of the planet, bar none. And I think about what makes us the best country on the face of the planet. How is it that our founders 200 plus years ago came up with this Declaration of Independence and this Constitution that are the guiding documents for who we are today. And how does that apply in 2019? And I, and I really, I, I've come to understand the older I've gotten that the hardest of times, the most difficult of times, the challenges and things that are thrown be, before us are actually the things that make us the strongest and make us the be better people. You know, I. I challenge you, and I've, I've had this great opportunity, this platform that I have on Fox News has afforded me the opportunity to go and talk to people all across the country. And, and one of the things I challenge people to do, is, as I do tonight, is I challenge you to figure out why. Like, why do you do what you do? It's one of the most beautiful Friday nights. You're here, got your ties on, you're, you're all dressed up. Why, why are you here? And I think it's a really good exercise to remind ourselves, not just at Thanksgiving, not just on the 4th of July, not just on Veterans Day, but to really kind of dig down and understand why is it that you do what you do. My theory here is that in this age of social media, that it's not good enough to just volley back and forth with 140 characters and try to outdo somebody and be more pithy and put something something out there that something's going to get retweeted. I mean, there's plenty of that. I participate in that. But that if we're truly going to move the meter, if we're truly going to move people in the conservative movement, the conservative thought, that conservatives really need to talk from their heart. I'm tired of thinking that you need to cede the, to the liberal side of the equation that they care more. You know, that's usually what you hear is, oh, they care more. And that they try to paint the, the right side of the aisle as, as cold and uncaring. They're going to literally push grandma off the cliff. And, and all they care about is money and things. You know, I, I grew up, I, I, again, I grew up in this idyllic household. I grew up not ever wondering where I was going to get my next meal. I never wondered if I was going to be safe at night. I never knew, I never wondered if I was going to, you know, lay my head down and, and just have a comfortable evening. Those are not things that I ever worried about. Um, 
is that I've gotten older, I've come to realize it's not that way for everybody. Now, when I was growing up here in part in Scottsdale, things started to happen to me. You wouldn't know it from the outside looking in. You know, you wouldn't just glance over. But I remember as a, as a young kid, one day my parents' uh, breakfast time came together with me and my younger brother, and they told me they were going to get divorced. That was devastating. I didn't know how to deal with that. When you're a young teenager and your parents are going to get divorced. I still remember my dad and my mom separately coming to us and saying, you know, this has nothing to do with you. I never heard him argue. I never heard him fight. It kind of blew me out of the water. It was tough. It was difficult. And as a young person, I didn't know exactly how to deal with that. I remember a couple years later, once my parents were divorced, that my mom uh, was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer. She was in her 30s. I didn't know what cancer was. I didn't really truly understand the devastation that lie ahead. I remember the, uh, you know, the 11 years that my mom fought that. And I only wish that the medicine that we have today, we had back then. And I remember those times being some of the hardest times, some of the most joyous times. You don't want to be that teenager that has to help mom, lift mom, you know, up off the bed so she can try to get to the bathroom in time. Things like that. Things that you wouldn't wish upon anybody else. Later, uh, my mom would pass away when she was younger than I am now. I, I still have those days where... You know, something good or exciting or dramatic happens in my life, and I think, oh, i got to call my mom. And she's not there, but in my prayers. I, uh, my dad was old school. My dad was one of those guys who said, I never gonna need to go see a doctor. Until all of a sudden I got a call from a doctor. He was in the emergency room getting surgery because he had colon cancer, had ignored all the symptoms, never had a checkup. And that colon cancer eventually took his life as well, just a few years ago. And for all you guys out here, I got the microphone, so I get a little bit of a, to preach to you. You got to get in there and get, get some business taken care of. I told the doctor, I'll, say, I'll be here every week if you need me to. And, <laughs> but you got to get business taken care of. And a reason that I tell you about those things, those personal things, is that every single one of you has your own story. You have that story. Whether it's a car accident, a stroke, cancer, leukemia, I, I don't know what it is. Financial trouble, it can be anything. Mental health issues within the family. We all have that, but our friends and neighbors also have that. If we're going to win this battle of ideas, if we're going to truly show the world that conservatism is a better, smarter way to do things, leading with our heart and explaining why you believe what you believe is something that I hope that we all do. Not only for your own friends and loved ones and neighbors, but the people you just come in contact with. I'm not suggesting you lead with cancer right off the bat, but I am suggesting that this volley that is social media, the, this almost noise that is on in the background near almost omnipresent, probably isn't as effective as it, we explain why we believe what we believe. One of the reasons I believe so strongly in the Goldwater Institute and what you're doing are things, and you, you all here, because you're ponying up your money, you're taking some of your time and your effort, and you're opening up your wallets. And I look back at that right to try. I still remember vividly my dad. <laughs> and mom would do just about anything. And I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time, the expertise, the money that it takes, the legal wrangling that it takes to truly make a difference in people's lives. 
And so when, you know, somebody tries to tell me that I don't care, I want to push grandma off the cliff, that we just want to be harsh on people, that's what I talk to them about. I cannot thank you enough for doing that. I'm amazed too, I want to tell you two stories, uh, but I'm amazed by ordinary people who do extraordinary things. In my life, I've seen a couple of car accidents. And uh, every case, there was somebody who jumped out of their car and got there so fast. I think about the men and women who answer the call to serve, whether it's in a hospital or being a nurse late at night. Being that 911 operator who takes the call from a frantic kid because he needs help from the police. There are amazing people who answer that call to serve, and they run into the flames, not away from them. You're going to hear from one of the great heroes of our country, Dan Crenshaw, here in a minute. I want to tell you about two other people that have touched my lives, and I just honored that you would invite me and ask me to share a couple of these stories. The first one is a, a guy that I need you to get to know. His name is Brian Mast. Brian is a member of Congress serving from Florida. He says the district just north of West Palm Beach. It's a pretty nice district. <laughs> Brian uh, served in the United States military. He was an explosives expert. Brian was trying to dismantle one of these IEDs when the bomb went off and he lost both of his legs. And Brian likes to talk about his dad visiting him in the hospital and telling him repeatedly, son, your, your best days are ahead of you. They're not behind you. You are going to have such an influence. His wife, he and his wife have four kids, amazing young kids. And he decided to run for the United States Congress, like Dan and like other veterans and people who have served this nation. I don't agree with Brian on all the issues, but I can never argue about his patriotism and his love of nation. I uh, hurt my foot once. I was doing such great service. I was, Julie asked me to go change a light bulb, and I went up to change the light bulb, electrocuted myself, fell back, and broke my foot in six places and had to have 14 screws and a plate put in it. That was my service, you know, to the country, trying to change this. That's so funny. I remember the, at the time I always happened to be, anyway, this guy comes over and he says, you know, how many people does it take to change a light bulb in this chair? <laughs> I mean, we should have had Julie doing this. I'm sorry we asked you to change the light bulb, but I hurt my foot. 10 years later, I was in Congress, my foot gets infected. Now they have to go in, tear out all the hardware, and put it all back together right as we're about to have the health care vote. And Paul Ryan calls up and says, uh, Jason, we need you here. We need you here tomorrow. We're having that health care vote tomorrow. Paul, if, if I get an infection in my foot, they're going to amputate my foot. He said, I don't care. <laughs> get on this plane. I will send you a plane. Get on that plane. I don't have a single vote to spare. Julie and I piled into this thing. I've got my foot up in the air. I get down there. I'm on this little Neil scooter, you know, going on the floor of the house. Remember, I did this because I broke a light bulb, right? <laughs> I get down on the floor of the house, and I wheel into the front. Sorry, I have a hard time getting through this one. Brian Mast. Both legs amputated, wearing his prosthetic devices. He sees me. Jason jumps up out of the seat. Here, you sit down. You sit down. I, you know how I just about melted. Here's a guy who really served his nation. He doesn't have any legs. And he told me to take his seat. It was a moment of humility that I will never forget. I want to tell you about one other person that I had a chance to meet. Oh, sorry, I got a 
John Boehner, you know. Yeah, nothing on me. It's another person I met. This guy's name is Carlos. I went to the Walter Reed Medical Center, a place that Dan's been, a place that Brian's been, a place that a lot of people have been to. I go to the Walter Reed Medical Center, and I'm leading six other members of Congress, and we're going to go down and visit the people who have lost limbs serving our nation. So we get there, and it's a room a little bit bigger than this, but, you know, it's a pretty good-sized room. And it's, uh, think of like an Olympic training center. It's light, it's beautiful, it's got good upbeat music, has the best food and snacks. They got psychologists there. They have the best doctors there. You'd be proud as an American. That's something you'd actually like to spend your taxpayer dollars on. This is what we should be doing in government, taking care of those that are taking care of us. We get in there, and I still remember the first young, pretty sure he was a Marine, that I met, he was 22 years old, okay, 22 years old. He was from New York, and he was um, in a wheelchair. And he had lost both of his legs, and uh, he had lost his left arm, and he had lost his right arm. And uh, we all sat there, we were kind of weeping, didn't know what to do, couldn't shake his hand. Uh, awkwardly tried to give him a hug and thank him for his service. And I still have this indelible impression of him in, the, in my mind and think about how devastating his life is. And we went around the room. There were 40 people there. They, that day they happened to be, all be men. Obviously women lose limbs as well. But we went around the room until I came across a guy named Carlos. And Carlos is perhaps the happiest American I've ever met he, to me, epitomized the American spirit because he was beaming from ear to ear. He was so happy. He was so feeling just good about life. Carlos had lost both legs and part of both arms, and yet he was smiling, and he talked about his love of country. He talked about his love of God. He talked about his love of his wife, and he talked about the love of his two children. And I just sat with him, and I was just fascinated by his story and what he believed in and how happy he was. Now, he had a support structure around him that maybe others didn't have. And the thing that struck me when I met with him is really captured on his shirt because I got a picture of him, and, and Julie will tell you this, but my little desk at home, I've got family pictures, and then me and Carlos. <laughs> because I'm sitting there with Carlos, and Carlos's shirt says, Wounded Combat Marine, some assembly required. <laughs> Here's what I'm trying to wrap up to you. You are stepping up and helping a very, very worthwhile organization. There are very few people that actually raise their hands and say, I will help. And you're doing that. We need more of you to do it. We need you to continue to do it. When you help fund things like the right to try, when you salute the veterans, when you institute those free market principles that actually drive our economy better so that families can be better off, the world is a better place. And at the end of the day, I know it's a vitriolic atmosphere. I'm in part making my living going out on Fox News talking about what a, you know, Adam Schiff is. I get that. But that's just because he is, and that's just all there is to it. But the spirit in which I'm telling you that will move this country more than any tweet more than any social media post, more than any four-minute segment on Fox News, is going to be the radiance that you give from your heart about why you believe what you believe. Why do you, why? Like, dig deep. It's not good enough to just say, well, it's the way it should be, and this fact is better than that fact. This number is better than that number. There's a deeper-seated reason. It's why you're here. And I hope and pray 
that we will share that with the rest of America and a new generation. I wish every young high school kid could have gone to meet Carlos, that could have gone and, and spent some time with Dan Crenshaw or Brian Mass or somebody who's actually really sacrificed to serve this nation. You all have that story inside of you and I hope we pass it on to future generations because you know what? The United States of America is the greatest country on the face of the planet. May God bless you and may God bless the United States. Thank you.